Well, welcome to this, the 22nd talk in the series Genesis, the first three chapters. And we've reached that point in chapter two, which gives an expanded view of the creation of humanity. You'll remember in chapter one, God created man and woman in his image. But now in chapter two, we get another version, an expanded version of the creation. So chapter two of Genesis, verses 18 to 22. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs, closed up the place with flesh afterwards. Then the Lord God made the woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. Now, setting aside the application of this to marriage, which will follow in a further talk, and the unusual nature of this account, we've got this particular episode where God seeks to find four the man, a companion, a helper, a suitable helper. And we'll look at those three facets of this story in a minute. The important thing, I think, for us all is that we are gregarious beings. We're made for fellowship with one another, not for isolation. Now, throughout the centuries, the church has been filled with examples of people who have sought to live a hermit-type life in solitude, some means of expressing their piety. There's one very peculiar example of this in the 5th century with a Syriac, an ascetic known as Simon or Simeon the Stylite. He engaged in ever increasingly bizarre ways of trying to live a hermit's isolated life. For instance, he spent 18 months in a small little hut trying to be pious and holy. After that, he spent an extended period of time on a small rock promontory. And then for 30 years, Simon the Stylite lived on a pillar, well, several pillars of ever-increasing height. And in this way, he sought to express his devotion to God. The problem is, the very isolation he sought was denied him because his fame grew and many people came to visit him. It seems bizarre, doesn't it? But I don't wish to criticise his or any particular person's way of trying to express their devotion to God and their piety. But I will say this. You'll remember that John's Gospel, chapter 17, the high priestly prayer of Jesus, he prayed specifically that his followers would not be taken out of the world, but be kept in the world, safe from the evil one. That's John 17. And verse 15. There's another interesting feature of this story. We know in chapter 1 of Genesis that God looked at his creation and repeatedly declared it to be good or very good. But this portion starts by saying something that God created was not good. It's not that it was imperfect, it was incomplete. It is not good that the man should be alone. And so God creates for him, in the most unusual way, a helper. And there are three facets. I've already hinted at them. A companion, a helper and a suitable helper. The word companion isn't actually in the text, but it's implied by all that's in there. And it also evokes what we understand in this Christian vocabulary as fellowship. A companion from the Latin word com and panis means to eat bread with or together with. It's that intimate fellowship of having a meal together. And that comes through in terms of the way Eve seems to complete Adam and that degree of intimacy being together. It evokes also for me that 1996 romantic comedy, Jerry Maguire, in that the male lead is played by Tom Cruise opposite René Zellweger and they fall in love 
And at one point, Tom Cruise looks at Renée Zellweger and says, you complete me. And it's a heartwarming romantic comedy. But there's a sense in which no human being fully completes us. Only God does. But God gives us people for intimate fellowship and loving relationships. This idea of eating a meal together also comes out elsewhere. Uh, you'll remember, for instance, in Psalm 23, that well-loved psalm which has pastoral imagery of uh, shepherd and sheep in the first four verses. Then in verses five to six, the imagery changes to a domestic scene where God sets out for his beloved people a meal. And in the final book of the New Testament, in Revelation, we've got this image in chapter 3 of Jesus knocking at the door of our lives as our churches and saying those who will open the door to him, he will come in and eat with them. So to eat with someone, companus, companionship, is what is offered us in another human being, but most excellently in our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. So returning then to Genesis chapter 2, it was not good for Adam to be alone, to be without a companion, one whose intimate fellowship he might enjoy. But then the text goes on to say that God is creating for him a helper. So a companion, yes, but a helper companion. Sometimes you hear people say, I don't need any help, thank you. I can do it all myself. It might be a protest of fierce independence. Yeah, if kindly help is offered, most people would accept. But God has decreed that Adam needs a helper. God has already told Adam that he has the task of naming all the animals, cataloguing them, etc., and caring for the environment. And he says, you can't shoulder this alone. You need a helper, someone to work alongside you and help you in this task. Co-workers can be annoying at times. Maybe we are annoying to our co-workers. But more often than not, fellowship, when it's extended to helpfulness, can be immensely enriching. This is brought out in the New Testament in some of the imagery of the church, for instance, the body imagery, where the body of Christ is looked at in terms of a hand and a foot and a head and an eye and hearing, and how we all need this interdependence with our co-workers, with our helpers. You see, there's no encouragement in the Bible for the notion of the church being a one-man man, hierarchical uh, band of leadership. It is collegiate with one another. It is accountable one to another. And it is one of mutual interdependency. That's the church. And then God says this of Adam, not only do you need a helper companion, you need a suitable helper companion. And then he creates Eve. There's nothing hierarchical or paternalistic in this. We mustn't read anything untoward into the fact that God created Eve from his rib and not from his head or his feet. That's fanciful uh, preaching uh, stuff. But really, the fact is, Eve is a suitable helper for Adam. Entirely appropriate, entirely fitting. Well, We'll go on to apply that to marriage at a later date. But I'd like you to reflect on this in marriage, for instance, or in one's social group or one's church. How might you revise your views of those who God has given to you to be suitable and helpful companions? They're God's gift to you. Well, thank you for listening and look out for the next talk in the series Genesis the first three chapters.